The following presentation was recorded live in Los Angeles, California for the 24th Annual Convention of the International Association of Square Dance Callers. This is Tape 8, Partners 1, A Family in Crisis or at Least Under Pressure. Good morning. We are ready to begin a couple of minutes late, delayed by the gentleman in the crowd. What else is <laughs> new? I heard one person say this morning that she didn't think she'd come to this session today because she didn't have a crisis in her family. And I was so <laughs> We're so about where I am today. <laughs> but I think we always have crises um, of one kind or another. And the interesting thing is, I, w I was hoping, I, I congratulate those of you who came uh, in spite of what it said in the program book, because um, I felt that the, the, it made it sound like they were small crises. Crises come in all sizes, we know that. We have small problems, we have emergencies, sometimes we have life-threatening events, and, li and events that change our lives completely, like illness and divorce and deaths in the family. We put together this panel Partly, um, we had some ideas from last year's suggestions, but Carter Lab, uh, the board, I guess, had also come up with dealing with crises and suggested that as the title. But I found in searching for panelists that dealing with some of the major crises in life is not something people are willing to get up on a panel and talk about. So um, we have a variety of topics here. I'm sure it, they will suggest some discussion. I would like you to listen to all four people before we discuss. And then um, what I was hoping was that we might even break into a couple of small groups. But maybe our group is going to be small enough so we can discuss all together uh, and talk about some of the other things that happened to us. I had hoped that by the time we got to that point, we would have engendered such a nice, friendly feeling that we could talk about some things that happen in the family that are, that are a little harder to talk about. So um, I have asked the panelists to give us short presentations. If you want to talk to them more, uh, as we've been saying, you can find them around the edges or you can ask specific questions of them. Um, Ellen Cole, who's on the end here, and I will introduce all the panelists, has sent me a whole list of suggestions for getting through a crisis. But I thought I would start off by reading a few because it will get us into the right mood. Number 16 on the list is, all things being equal, fat people use more soap. <laughs> These are thoughts to get you through a crisis. <laughs> and now, what sort of evidence supports the notion that life is serious? And the last one thing is, the trouble with life is, you're halfway through it before you realize it's a do-it-yourself thing. I like that one. I like that. Now, let me tell you who's on the panel. Uh, to my left, we have Ellen Cole, who supplied the list of how to get through a crisis. And... Um, I will introduce each one of them with their topics as they're ready to go. This is Gail Seastrom on my immediate left. To my immediate right is Anna Dixon. We already had a crisis with this panel because last Monday morning, Pat Anthony, who was listed to be on it, called me, and she's had some medical problems and was not going to be able to make the trip. Fortunately, the day before, my husband had seen Anna in Manchester, New Hampshire, and Anna said, if I can do anything to help, let me know. <laughs> so I said, Anthony, guess what? Is off the top. She said, I was going to call Anna today anyway. So she mailed her speech to Anna, and Anna is going to give it with maybe a thought or two of her own to add. And on my uh, far right, you know, 40-some years of dancing, and I have to stop and think, which is left and right stuff. <laughs> on, <laughs> on my far right is Roy Gata, um, one of our valuable partners who is going to talk about another topic. These are, some of us are talking about small crises. Um, and, and Roy is talking about one that happens almost every day. <laughs> We're going to start with Gail Seastrom. Uh, when I talked to her on the phone, I called her to see if she had suggestions for other people. And before we were through with the conversation, we found a, a problem that she was coping with that she was happy to come and talk about. So we'll turn it right over to Gail. I'm always happy to talk about my kids. And she wants me to do it in 10 minutes. Good luck. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, forget these guys. I haven't talked about my kids. I have teenagers. How many have teenagers still at home? Aren't we lucky? <laughs> I have a 14-year-old and a 19-year-old who left home and is now back, having faced the realities of financial life on his own. And I lost my guest room. But anyway, um, 
I suppose I cope with teenagers just like anybody else does. One of the things that we have that happens at our house is we have the house that everybody hangs out at. And everyone comes to our house, even if my kids aren't home, they come to my house. Uh, and so when this started occurring and we were getting ready to go to a dance and I heard the jacuzzi go, out, go on out in the backyard and the telephone was ringing and I realized that they were coming to the house and I was going off to the dance, we made some changes in in how many times I actually go to dances with Mike. And so at great sacrifice, because I really do like to go to the dances with my husband, I have decided to be home. And a good thing, too, that I am, because it's just, this is a very short time in, in their life and, a, and actually a very short time in mine that I, it's important that I be there. And I find that having been a hands-on mom with my 90-year-old really resulted in a terrific kid, and I want the 14-year-old to grow up the same way, even though we're going to fight tooth and nail to get there. If he lives to be 19, is the way I look at it. <laughs> so basically what it's come down to is a, is a conscious decision on my part to be at home. Mike can go ahead and do the dances without me, albeit not as well as far as I'm concerned. But uh, I have to be at home with him. I also have the ability to work at home. I have my own business, so that allows me to be home when they get home from school. And that's how I cope with them. I'm very fortunate, and other than typical shenanigans, we have not really had, knock on wood, any real problems with our boys. And I hope that it stays that way. But that's how I cope, and, and, and that's just deciding to give up a few things to put in the effort to, to raise dependable, responsible young men, and it's, it's working. Our 90-year-old, uh, right after high school, actually the following January after high school, went into the Marines as a reservist to get fire training because he wants to be a fireman in the public sector. And as soon as he got out of the Marines, he moved into his own apartment, never thinking that rent was due and electric bills and telephones. And, and by God, we got to eat. And do you know you have to put four quarters in the washing machine to get your laundry done? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it doesn't put four quarters on the washing machine now, I'll tell you that. But anyway, so he's come home, which has caused some, you know, some growing pains again. I had this real nice guest room, and now I have all these posters and everything back up on the walls and no, no guest room. But uh, we're all coping very, very well, and, and they're both terrific kids, and I, and I do see the value of the time that I have invested in them, and I will continue to do so, and that's really how I cope. Our kids don't dance, have never square danced, have no desire to square dance, and uh, don't mind going with us from time to time, and did quite a bit when they were small, but um, it's, that's not part of their life, and so we've kind of tried to meet in the middle between the amount of time that we spend square dancing, and they give us that much time to go and do that as well. So it's over the years when they were really small, Mike made an effort not to be gone during the weeknights. That was family time. And Sunday day is family time. And, and, and I do have to say that our investment in them has returned to us many, many times over. So it's been well worth the effort. Have I got some more time? I have pictures. I could, uh, <laughs> only three minutes? Oh, I, you know, I... I I don't consider having a crisis. I really, maybe I'm not taking enough time. I, we, I, we've been very lucky. We've not had to have the police come knock on the door late at night or um, any fires that we didn't expect to have or anything like that. But I, I, I do honestly say that sometimes I resent having to be home. I resent them, him going off to the dance, and that is a good part of our social life. And yet it's... As I said, it's, it's an investment that has returned to me, but it, it, it was difficult to make. There was no choice who was going to be the person that had to give them the time. It was me. You know, that's all that there is to it. I'm sorry I didn't take my ten minutes. <laughs> oh, this leaves more time for discussion. But I think I heard someone say it was on a TV discussion show a week or so ago. It's a, it's a rerun of an old one. But I heard someone say that we don't sacrifice anymore. We don't think about sacrifice. Now, what Gail has just told us is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice I think a lot of mothers are faced with making, and, and therefore I think it's inspirational. Um, I also am very jealous, because how can you have a 19-year-old son and look 19 yourself? <laughs> Thank you, Gail. And we're going to discuss, I'm sure this will come up again later on, because many of us have dealt with, with those kinds of problems. Um, one of the crises that happens every day, and sometimes when you're in a great rush, it's worse than usual, uh, and sometimes it's just because you get so rushed and so harried with so many things you don't even want to think about food, is the idea of planning good and eating well in our, in our um, sort of hectic activity. So we have a... Um, 
representative of a two-career family, also a two-involvement two in school family, who still have to manage all the everyday chores. And so Roy Gotta volunteered to talk to us about food. I really do like to eat. And fortunately, uh, my wife likes to cook. Well, and to, to find out how we arrived at some of the things we do. Uh, as I said, Betsy loves to cook and even more so likes to prepare food. But we both have full-time day jobs and we are also consider ourselves to be full-time caller cures, uh, being as we do that about 245 evenings a year. So that's actually more days than we spend at our day jobs. So we have two careers and a full-time business. So mealtime tended to be, and early on in our marriage, it was, it was not a, a pleasant time. And we ate a lot of hot dogs and fast food and cube steaks. And uh, to be honest, Betsy felt quite guilty about doing that. And so over the years, she has uh, developed uh, just wonderful meals that usually she can uh, get home at quarter after five, and we've had dinner and changed and loaded the car and showered and ran out of the house by quarter after six or 6.30. But it took a lot of years of, of research and, and some careful planning to do that, and I guess a little bit of cooperation on my part, which mostly is stay out of the way when she gets home. I've offered to help, and she says, get out of the way. <laughs> but what we do and, uh, is... And I brought some stuff along, and I want to talk about resources that are available to you and then some of the things that we do. And I'll try and keep this uh, under 10 minutes. But several things, and I have a handout which has all of the, um, uh, the book here, which has, uh, sure, uh, I want to talk about, I have the ISBN number, so if it does, isn't at your local bookstore or anything, you can give them the number and they can get it for you. Just some of the things that are out there. This one is a Reader's Digest book. It's called One Dish Meals, The Easy Way. All right. Where did I get this? I teach at a vocational high school. Where are you using it? In the culinary arts classroom. All right. And some of the things that are in there, just as an idea, it's like 350 pages, one dish recipes, all of them can be done in under an hour, and a lot of them in under a half an hour. Uh, there's an excellent chart in here on substitutes. How many times are you in the middle of preparing a meal and you realize, oh, damn, I'm out of that? Well, there's a chart in here on what you can substitute for it and it covers an awful lot of things. It also has an equivalent measure chart that's very easy to read, going, you know, liquid and dry measure, and their equivalents. You know, how many ounces are there in two tablespoons type of thing. It also has a metric conversion. All right, if you're cooking Japanese, I guess. I don't know. And <laughs> there's a, a special chapter on extra quick and easy meals. And there's also a chapter on microwave meals. Uh, microwaves are not just for heating things up. You can cook with them. <laughs> And there are all kinds of neat things that you can buy now, accessories for microwaves, browning pans, baking pans, almost anything you can do in an oven, you can do in a microwave now if you have the right equipment. We haven't cooked a steak in the oven, I don't know how long. We do London broil all the time using the, the browning pan that you get for, for the microwave. Okay, magazines. And these are two that we subscribe to. I'm not pushing these magazines, I'm just giving you examples. This one, Cooking Right, and I have a phone number on the handout uh, on what to do. But in today's lifestyle, with you know, the busy people and all that, just about every single issue has some sort of article on, like this one. Where is it? Uh, uh, it doesn't say on the cover, but uh, just when I was looking in at the table of contents, uh, there was something on a quick meal. Where is it? Can't find it. Yep, could have been done. <laughs> it's... Uh, and I just grab these. We keep these on file. I have a, it's like a library filing system for these that I got some stuff that the library was throwing out that they keep their magazines in. So I got those. And, but there's all kinds of, you know, quick and easy recipes. This one, food and wine. I mean, you got to wash it down with something. But uh, just here, right on the cover, quick, cool meals, summertime meals that are quick to do and easy to do. So get these resources. Read them, okay? Frozen vegetable boxes, bags, and canned food products. Most of them now have recipes on them. Some of them are excellent. And if you realize that most of the stuff that you buy, like frozen vegetables or canned food, that stuff's already cooked. All you have to do is combine it and heat it up. The trick is being creative in combining it. Uh, so, you know, these are resources that are available to you. I'm talking as quick as I can. Things we do at home for quick meals. Stir fry. How many of you know how to do stir fry at home? You don't need any, a wok or anything. It's a big old deep dish fry pan type thing. What a way to use leftovers. 
you know, you can stir fry anything and it somehow tastes good. But, well, I guess raisins don't work too well. But, but and there's even a chapter in here on stir fry. Sauces. That's these two favorites. This uh, butter pecan sauce and a uh, lemon butter almondine. We're directly from the company, there's an address here, by the case. And they're just one of the things we keep in our staple cabinet. Now, Betsy's experimented with them, has created four or five different sauces using this as, as the base. And then, basically, uh, by varying the meat or the fish that she mixes with this, chicken, uh, uh, shrimp, uh, um, chopped last week, you know, that type of stuff, you can, um, and then change what you put it over type of pasta, you know, linguine, or shells, or uh, rice. Uh, you've got 10 or 12 different meals that you can make in under half an hour. And we keep in our cabinet, there's a, a large supply of different pastas. And it's, and whenever we have pasta and there's leftover, it stays in the refrigerator because it's real easy. Just to, with hot water, suddenly it's like fresh pasta again. All right, uh, that's the sauces, that's the stir fry. Okay, one last thing I have on here, and that's when you know you're gonna be eating in the car on the road. <laughs> we do that occasionally. Now, used to be, all right, uh, where's the Roy Rogers on the way, or where's the Wendy's? And by the way, we keep in each of our cars a bath towel, because it's tough to be neat when you're driving. I like that uh, yeah. If when you're next at the dentist next time, pick up some of the patient bibs. They'll be happy to give you a dozen. They're plastic backed, and they don't get anything on your clothes. And normally you wear them in the dental office, so if you have a numb lip and you drool on yourself, you don't get your clothes wet. But I'm telling you, I keep a stack of those in the car. It's the same thing. You can just throw them away. It's very And also your fish fry places give you those bibs when you have the lobster. Just say to them, oh, could I have a couple of those? And they give them free, too. Uh, next year at the convention, uh, Mike can bring. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we should have had handouts. Okay. <laughs> I have an appointment in two weeks, so that'll be good. <laughs> Something my mother used to make all the time, which is great for us, it's called supper on a bread slice, and how we prepare it is in here. But very quickly, take a loaf of French bread, slice it, scoop out the center, make your favorite meatloaf recipe, put it in the bread, bake it, make sure it's on a rack in a pan in the oven. You want the rack because you don't want that to be sitting in grease uh, that's coming from the hopefully very, very lean ground beef. You cook this up the day before. Now you know you're going to be eating in the car. It's one of those dances that are three hours away and you only have two and a half hours to get there. So, and you put this, you bake it, just cook it like you would a meatloaf. When the meatloaf is done, this thing is done. Whatever your favorite recipe is, take it out, let it cool, slice it. It's very easy to eat. And it's pretty much a balanced meal depending on what you put in the meatloaf. Got your bread and your meat and all that. It's neat, it's not messy, and it's quick, and it's tasty. So that's one of our favorites. I talked about the towel. Last thing I have on here, it should be noted that when you're experimenting with no and easy recipes, you should do your experimenting when you are not rushed for time because usually the first time you do them, they're not so and easy. And then plan the meal ahead of time. I know it sounds silly, some of the things I wrote down here, but Betsy's driving home from work. She knows she's doing a pasta de meal. You better put the water on to cook the pasta as soon as you get home. Otherwise, you finish the sauce. Oh, man, the water's not boiled. Or if you're going to be doing something in the oven, you get home, before you take your coat off, turn the oven on. Or she'll call me and say, turn the oven on. I can usually handle about that much. So, last thing, cellular phones. We have in our car, in this little packet, uh, let me see, two Chinese restaurant menus and one pizza parlor. There's a couple dances that we drive to. Okay, if traffic's with us, we can have dinner. If it's against, we don't get dinner. And if it's in between, we call up the Chinese restaurant, order takeout, but tell them we're going to eat it there. And it's ready when we get there. And we've saved the 15 minutes it would take for them to take our water and do that. Just a little thing to keep in mind. Thanks. Good. Thank you, Ray. To do this, I presumed he prepared the food. So I think he was to tackle a subject like this. <laughs> so let's have a hand for Ray. <laughs> now, Ellen is a husband who travels, and um, when you're when you're employed and have a husband that travels, and sometimes you go with him, and sometimes you don't, 
that also presents a problem and sometimes moments of crisis. So Ellen's going to tackle that subject. Thank you, Kathy. Like she said, my husband's Larry Cole, and he does a lot of extensive traveling in our area, uh, in a three-state area. Uh, the home, we don't run too many home programs. Larry is booked mostly out every Friday and Saturday night. We both work full time. So if you've got a three hour dance to drive to, you know, you've got not much time at home. Um, we are fortunate right now that our teenage daughter She's not a teenager anymore. She's 24 years old and just finished college and has moved back home with us. <laughs> and I kind of feel fortunate having her there because she does do some things for me to help me out occasionally. Um, so that helps me with my time at home. I kind of want to talk today about time management. And we all have families. We all are working. We're all um, working ahead more hours in the day. Uh, we have plenty of time to do everything that is important to us, and I, I think that's what kind of what I want to talk to today is that if it's important, you're going to find time to do it. We just have to use our time to more better advantage, more effectively, so that we have time to do that thing that we really like to do, square dance. Simply, our life isn't about letting go of the things that are meaningful, but about disregarding the things that are no longer really contribute to our life. You can write your name in most any piece of furniture you want to in my house because I don't dust. I do have found a tablecloth to put over most of my tables so you can't see the dust on them. Um, I found that dusting isn't my thing and so I just don't worry about it. It's not important in my life. I used to be a very, very picky housekeeper, and Larry used to say I probably wash the dishes the day I die because I put everything in its place when I left the house. And um, I was trying to find ways to kind of beat the clock, and if I've got an extra few minutes, I find time to, to do those little extra things. And if you'd like to pass this out, we, you can kind of look at that. That's kind of some things that if you've got 20 minutes or 15 minutes or 10 minutes, maybe what you might do to, to get some things done at home. So you kind of like to find the time of day you work best. I am not a morning person, even though I have to get up early to get to work. I find that if I get up two hours before I know I have to leave, I've got time to wash those breakfast dishes, put in a little laundry, make the bed, maybe set the table for supper, and then I don't feel so worried when I get home from work and I know that we've got to leave in 45 minutes. Some of those things are already done. I don't have to write any details in my head. I have a list to make a list. I have a list for everything. Um, we have three calendars. I carry one in my purse. Larry carries one with him at all times, and I have one on the wall by the telephone. So that I know where we're going to be. Um, this is my reminder list. When I go to work in the morning, I usually have a list that I've stuck in my book bag. And when I get up to work in the afternoon, I know what I've got to do before I get home. When I get it, it's kind of like something I cross it off. I used to go to a time management class a couple of weeks ago, and I'm kind of a, I'm a procrastinator. Maybe some of you are, too. It's a very difficult task. It seems to be on the bottom of my list. I kind of, I go through and I check off those easy things first. I get all those easy things done first. Like, I knew I was going to have to do this six months ago, and I was last week really just putting my thoughts down on paper. Um, those, those really tough jobs I kind of put off to the last minute. And being a, being a school teacher, uh, sometimes I was time because I know I've always got tomorrow to get it done. When I'm working during the school year, I think I do my, use my time a little better. But in the summertime, I think, oh, I've got, I've got another day. I can always do that. I started today by getting ready for it the night before. I finally out and plan what I'm going to wear to school the next day. That saves me a whole lot of hassle and time. Hunting a green blouse or hunting something that needs 
don't want to be ironed or uh, and I'm fortunate I don't have to dress up. I teach in a preschool with three, four, and five-year-olds, and I don't have to dress up every day. Uh, but if those things are ready, if my clothes are ready, and I've got them laid out, then I've got an extra ten minutes in the morning to get something else done. Find a pleasurable way to use your idle time. It may be sitting or knitting or reading or watching TV or if it's just taking a nap. Find a plan that pleasurable time. Give yourself some extra time so you can do the things you really want to do. I like to assign those regular tasks um, to a particular day. I know that on Thursday mornings I'm going to change the bed. That's something I always do. That's a routine. I know that on Saturday morning I'm going to run the vacuum. Uh, I do plan those things ahead of time. I know that's my regular routine. I'm going to do that, and that that's time slot for that. If I've got extra time on Saturday, I like to plan my meals ahead for the next week, maybe make a casserole, make a dessert, make a salad, and then I know that's going to last us a couple days, three days through the weekend. We're going to have leftovers a couple nights. I never said anything about the food I fix, nothing about the meals. He's happy to eat anything I fix, and if I say we're just going to have leftovers tonight, that's fine with him. But I like to fix a big casserole, and then I know that night that we have to be on the road in a half an hour, we still have time to eat. Most of the things he does are at least two hours dry for him. So time he gets home from work and gets ready to go, he doesn't have a whole lot of time to eat. I can celebrate my errands so that I do them all at the same time. Um, if I know I've got to pay a bill or run to the Walmart or stop by the grocery store or whatever it is to do. Um, I plan to do that maybe all on the day that the evening that we do have to get away. Wednesday nights is usually our home night free. So that Wednesday night after school I've got time to run errands because I don't have to get supper on the table right away. I haven't done that much yet but I'm really thinking about it and that's making use of other services. Have one, someone in your yard. Maybe your luxury is get someone to clean your house once a week. Um, the extra money that might cost uh, is going to give you that freed up time um, to do something else you really want to do. And I think it's worth it. Um, make use of other services. And what do you have on your own role? Um, plan a, a, a meal ahead of time or some things like that. One of the things that I do to get ready to go, to get ready to go, that we're going so much on trips and weekends, is that I keep a bag packed all the time of those things that I, those cosmetics, those, the hair dryer, um, the soap, the powder, the toothpaste, those things are always packed in a suitcase. When I get home this week, I'll go for that, restock it, repack it, and when we go the next weekend, I know I don't have to worry about that. That bag is all ready to go. All I have to do is get our clothes ready. I still do a lot of ironing, and I, I heard some people at breakfast this morning say they didn't forget that she didn't iron anymore. Uh, but I do iron a lot. I wear a dress shirt a lot, and so um, I, I, have, I do a lot of ironing. I like to iron. Um, so when I'm working at the computer and I'm watching TV, I, I can stand there and iron and we can visit or watch TV or whatever. Um, but I like to spend the whole evening ironing and that I know that when I get home and get ready for that dance, that outfit I'm going to wear is already ready to go. Uh, look at that paper. It kind of, kind of fun to, to look at those quickie little jobs. You've got 20 minutes or an extra 15 minutes or an extra 10 minutes that you can stick in a little extra job. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Okay. Well, the, thing, uh, well, the nice things about coming to Coral and having these kind of sessions is that you find out you're not alone. And I'm also going to find out that Ellen doesn't like to dust, because neither do I. I. I'll tell you a little secret, though. I grew up with a mother who was very picky, and she went around after I dusted. She always found something. So I grew up 
Oh, I think it was the best. And years ago, we went to a convention in Las Vegas and had a book. And a man was selling those long, um, fluffy dusters on a rod. And now I sort of pretend I'm a fairy godmother. <laughs> and I go through my house like this. And, and it needs to look good. I go through with a little furniture, furniture polish. But that, it's, it's, it's bright pink, and I love the color, and I just wave it around every now and then. And I think, no, I've dusted. That's a lot more fun than going around with a cloth. And little things amuse little minds, you know. But we have fun in our lives. Pat Anthony about being on this panel. We had a long discussion on the phone. Uh, I don't know Pat very well. I've met her, but I don't know her well. And we got to talking. One of the main things she said was that no caller team could get through a crisis without both people. Um, doing something, you know, you have to pitch in and do something. And I know we all have uh, the stories. I don't know just what tack she's taken, and I didn't know where to tell this story, but I'm going to tell it here, and then we'll listen to that, and then maybe we can talk. Um, we all have major crises in our lives that don't deal with finding enough time for little jobs and, and making the right kind of move, although those are important things. Uh, Stan was on the road traveling down to Knoxville, Tennessee on a weekend when I got the word in Ohio that his father had died. He was not available on Friday night. I didn't know what motel he was in, and I could not reach him. So I had to call the people he was going to stay with on Saturday, who happened to be a minister and his wife, which was nice, uh, and to tell him that, you know, to break the news to Stan. And he called home and found that he could get there very well on Sunday. So he had to call a dance on Saturday night, all by himself, knowing all the time that his father, you know, he was sort of broken up because his father was, had died. Um, the kinds of crises, I think, are a little more major, and we dealt with. Now, that was one that I can tell from our own experience, but um, there are other kinds of, of crises that maybe involve a whole group of people or a whole family crisis um, when you know you need to be there. For a lot of us have had weddings in the family, which is a happy crisis, but it's still a crisis. I remember driving 16 hours or 18 hours in one day from Birmingham, Alabama, back to Ohio from the Square Dance Convention to get there in time for a wedding the next night. So we've all done those kinds of things, too. And we've had to adjust, and we both have to pitch in and do things. Now, I think that the stories that... that um, you know, I'm going to read from Pat's talk, go along that line. And I want you to be thinking, because I'd like that to be sort of maybe the focus of some of our other discussion, too. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I want you all to know that Pat Anthony and I are approximately the same height. So I'm 5'1", and she, I think, is just 5 foot. I'm heavier than she is, so she's better on that point. <laughs> but uh, she really wanted to express her sorrow at not being here to share this information with you in person. So I'll do the best I can to read the letter. But before I do that, I'd like you to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm married to Mill Dixon, who is sitting over there, and he's been calling 27 years. We have six children who are all grown now, and the last one just got married last year, and we just had our 12th grandchild the 18th of January. So as you can see, we have a lot of people in our lives that we're trying to fit into what's happening in our activity here. And you're right, it is pre-planning that is one of the most important things for a caller and a caller's partner. So having said that, let me read Pat's letter. My name is Pat Anthony. My husband is Art. He's a caller and I cue rounds. We started dancing in 1955, and Art started calling in 1959. The four years that we danced affected our calling and cueing relationships with dancers. We have always felt close to our dancers, and when we had clubs, we always went dancing with them on visits to other callers. We still have close friendships with these people who are, for the most part, still dancing back in Rhode Island. That's a little background on us. Now to the time managing problem. When your significant other, as they say today, tells you that he or she wants to be a caller, be prepared for a complete change of lifestyles. I did not realize what a difference it would make when Art decided to be a caller. 
The first thing you must do is sit down together and plan how you are going to handle this new business partnership. And it is a business. It will require that the both of you work hand in hand in order to make it work. This business will cut deeply into your lives, time, friendships, family celebrations, and relationship. First, what are your priorities? Do you have children? What about your school and sport activities? When are their birthdays and so on? You should try not to book on special occasions if you can. Another thing to be aware of is taking a date in advance, as we all must do at times. It is also inviting when a club 200 miles away wants you to call for them on a Tuesday night. <laughs> but the closer you get to this date, the more you wonder why you took it. Be careful when you book dates that you might turn, that it might turn out to be the day before your daughter's wedding <laughs> or the championship soccer game that your son is in. We did not book on Sundays while our children were growing up. We also took most of the summers off, except for some of the outdoor dances that were being run in our area, and we tried to take the kids to those. The two of you should make a list of things that have to be done, meals, housework, shopping, doctor's appointments, so on, and what can wait. If you are both working, you already have set up some sort of a routine that you follow. He does this, you do that. But now a more serious look is needed. Do not be discouraged. Any busy active person will tell you it is possible to squeeze in extra duties and stretch your time much further than you think you can. You must be organized. He or she will need time to practice, and you can both work on what time of day or night is best for the both of you. Discuss this together. The house must be organized. The old-fashioned, a place for everything and everything in its place, is a good rule to try to follow. Can you show that to my wife? <laughs> <laughs> you will not have time to deep clean, but you can give a lick and a promise if a reasonably clean house is one of your priorities. Again, priorities is the magic word. Art and I would sit and go over the week ahead, dances scheduled, appointments, everything coming up that week. Then we would decide who would be able to do each of the things on the calendar. I did not work outside of the home for the first 27 years of our marriage, so the bulk of the chore, house and kids, became my job in our new business. But without our helping, I would not have been able to do it. Our daughters, one is 33 and one is 44, are both career wives and mothers, and I have learned a lot from watching them cope. The bulk of the running of the home still rests with the female, even though the husbands of today try to take over some of the work involved. The truth is that the wife still bears the brunt of the work with home and kids. If she is the caller part of the partnership, her husband must be behind her 100%. The song, Wind Beneath My Wings, has become our song. I becomes the wind beneath my wings, and I become the wind beneath his wings. We haven't crash landed yet. The division of work is not covered in stone. Sometimes we take over each other's jobs when one of us is sick, for example. Flexibility is another key word. Priorities, compromise, and flexibility are the watchwords of this business. I had a great deal of trouble because I am not by nature a flexible person. I do not adjust to change in my routine easily. We have been married 45 years, and there have been many minor wars during this time when our plans had to be scrapped and everything broke down. Our sense of humor and patience has pulled us through, and we would get back on track again. I cannot emphasize the working together enough. You must make time to sit down together and talk about how things are going, especially during the crises that will arise periodically. Driving to or from the dances was the best time for us to talk with no interruptions. Making a success of this special partnership of caller and spouse will bring fun and enjoyment and a feeling of accomplishment. We feel that we have received much more than we gave and have wonderful memories of shared experiences with dancers and callers through the years. Remember, priorities, flexibility, and compromise. Season them with love and humor, and your new business venture will succeed far beyond your expectations.
Yeah. You want to add anything? <laughs> okay, just an extra minute here. I would, uh, as Jerry Dunk said, we should have a little humor in this and not be so dead serious, even in our crises. So I have to tell you a little story. Uh, there was this lady that went with her caller husband to the doctor because he wasn't feeling well. He was on a lot of stress crises. And when he went to the doctor, he examined him and he said to her, uh, send your wife in, I'd like to speak to her, but I want to do it in private. So the wife went in and the doctor looked at her and he said, you want your husband to live a long time, don't you? She said, well, absolutely. And he says, well, I tell you, there are a few things that you're going to have to do so that he will live a long life because if not, he'll die. She says, oh, tell me, what is it? And he said, well, first of all, he said, you have to create a calmness in your family life. Then he said, I want to make sure that when he goes out to call, that you have all of his clothes put out on the bed, you have the dinner ready so that he can eat it in a half an hour so that you can be on time when you get to the dance. And remember, don't talk about any problems on your way to the dance. So she's thinking about this. And then he said, now, once you get to the dance, he said, remember, the caller is very important. He cannot be disturbed. He said, so don't try to choreograph his dance program for him on the way to the dance. He already knows what he's going to do. Oh, okay. And don't forget, after the dance on the way home, don't criticize what went on. Now, if you do all of these things, your husband will live a long, long life. So she thanked the doctor, and she left, and her husband said, what did you say? What did you say? And she says, well, I, I really don't want to tell you. <laughs> and he says, what did he say? He said, you're going to die. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the one the story I heard like that mentioned that after the dance when you go home and he wants to cuddle, you have to be willing all the time. Oh. <laughs> that's just an if you tell the story to someone else, that's just one more piece of advice you have to add. Um, and looking out, and we have, our panelists have all been very good, and we do have enough time. I'd like to see if we could uh, pull around into little groups just for maybe another ten minutes and just talk among yourselves, and then we'll come back and talk all together. So um, I'm not even going to cry. I know we've got sort of a ma good makings of a little group over there. And um, whatever is convenient, just if you can turn around and talk to the people behind you so you get five or six people together, just put yourself off in a little group. And, and give your reactions to what's been said this morning. If you feel that you can share the story of a major crisis in your life that you were able to handle together, let us know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Does anyone have anything from the group that you would like to share? And please, it has to be on the mic because of the tape. And we should thank Frank Lascunia, who is going to be our mic man. Uh, here's, a, here's one right here. I just have one thing to share with the group, and this is pertaining to meals in the car. First of all, I'm April Kendall. I'm from Fairfield, California. My husband's been calling about 14 years. He has a full-time job, and he calls five to six nights a week, and we do a lot of meals in the car. And it's not meals on wheels. <laughs> but I would happen to be in a department store one day, and I was going by the children's department, and I found a tray like the old car hops used to have. It's a brightly colored tray with a rounded edge, and it's got about an inch lip, and the plate sits in there nicely, and it has a compartment for your, your um, cup or drink to sit down in. fits on the, um, on the passenger side or in the back seat, and it just hooks onto the window, and it's got a little lever that hooks down underneath it to hold it stable. And it was about thirteen, fourteen dollars. It wasn't very expensive. And then of course it collapses so that you can just lay it flat, you know, in the trunk or in the back window or someplace easy. Sometimes behind the seat you can they have a pocket you can just sit in there. But it, it is very convenient. Not only is it convenient to have that tray there because you have a place to put your fork and stuff and you don't have to balance this plate on your lap, but is also about the level almost um almost to your chin, so you can't drop as many things. <laughs> so it's very serviceable. So if you do a lot of meals in the car, 
think about that. It is, is an extra thing that you have to carry with you, but it's very worthwhile. How many have husbands that eat and drive? How many have husbands who eat and drive? Gail wants to know. <laughs> I think we've all done that sometimes. Uh -huh. I'm Vicki Hansen, and my husband's Chuck Hansen, and we he calls in Yuma, Arizona, and Surprise, Arizona. We go to Surprise two days a week, and the very first night, the day that we went to Surprise, on the way home that night, our car broke down, and we had to spend the night in Hilla Bend. Well, we didn't have anything with us. So now we carry our makeup, his shave kit, extra underwear, and also my husband had had a heart attack, so he has all of his medication, so I carry extra medication. So if our car ever breaks down again, we're prepared. That's what I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In California, we call that an earthquake kit. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to mention that while we're out? Do we have anything else? Just a minute, when we were looking for people for this, um, and, uh, if anyone with a baby had registered yet, and she said, and of course, the woman who was here last year with a baby was not coming back since she was from overseas, and we didn't know about this little girl that we have with us today. So, what kind of thing you want to say about how you handled pregnancy and all was going to have calling? We'd be glad to hear that one too. If the spouse tells the caller the things that we've heard, oh, well, that was just your conversation. But if it comes from the authority speakers, maybe they will hear what we are saying. Mm -hmm. We do. I want to say two things. The tickets are for sale. And if you have other suggestions, we'll take this one. But if you have other suggestions for um, the, the Partners Committee, please come to the committee meeting at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning where we can hash out some of this stuff. Okay. I think that's a fabulous idea. And since the inception of the Partners Committee, how many years ago, we've entertained that thought many times. And it doesn't always fly when it gets to the powers that be. Um, my own personal feeling, and I may be wrong, that those that need to hear this the most will be the least likely to attend. <laughs> Not that we don't love them, because we do, but um, I, I still am in, in, in agreement with you. It would be nice to have a joint session. There are so many other things that they also want to accomplish while they are here. That this sometimes is not high on the list of priorities, although it is for us. I do want to share a story with you. I was telling the panel up here about one time we had a day that was extremely stressful. It was opening day at baseball, and someone had a piano recital, and it was more things to do in the day than there really were hours to do it, and we were trying to get ready to go to the dance and pick up the sitter and yada yada and I put my finger through my last pair of pantyhose trying to get dressed and I was just over the edge which is a short trip for me actually and Mike said just wait a minute we'll just, we'll just go in the closet we'll close the door and I'll count to three and we'll just scream as loud as we can and we'll be so calm when it's over you know so I thought this was a great idea so we're in there and we, I mean we just really let loose and we opened the door and here were the five-year-old and the ten-year-old boys going do you think they're going to be okay? Do you think it's all right? <laughs> but we, we really were very calm. They quite haven't gotten over it. They still tell the story about us. So. Uh, I got a story. Do no. you want to make a comment? Just, um, Gail pretty much covered it. We actually did try one year to have a session where we specifically invited the callers to come to this, and it was ex very poorly attended, mostly the spouses of the people on the panel. And because <clears throat> I've been off and on with this committee since, I don't know, 76, I think. And they have so many other things here that they've come for. And it's probably uh, better to take the material to them when you can find some sort of appropriate time, which is usually never. But, and the other place we have found that this can be effective is at your local associations. They're trapped there. Uh, a lot of your local caller associations have an education session during the meeting, and we have been able to present a lot, at least in our area, present a lot of this material at those meetings. And um, it was a little more effective than trying to get them to give up something they might really want to be at here. The other thing I could mention on that is, you know that critique sheet that a lot of us don't fill out? Well, this is the time to fill it out and write this. Even if nothing comes of it, they'll be aware that people want it. It's also, I heard them say that you can buy any one tape, so you could always buy a tape and make a gift. Play it in the car. Yeah, yeah. play it in the car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> 
say that on the mic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me do say though that in terms of of the callers appreciating the role that the partner plays in their success has certainly been brought home to them with the inception of the Partners Committee. They do appreciate it. Not that they didn't before, but we feel that we're getting recognition in terms of what we, the part that we play in terms of making our partner a successful caller. And it's not just getting to the dance and calling a good dance. It's all the other things you have to do before you get there. It's making the booking and talking on the telephone and getting the clothes ready and there's gas in the car and, and just creating that, that arena where they can be successful. And I... It doesn't bother me to say that I play a big part in that, and I think that being on this, having this committee has brought that home to the callers, I think, a lot. Some of you who are new may not know that when Mike Seastrom was uh, chairman of Caller Lab, he made his chairman's award to Gail, which was one of the best things that ever happened for the partners of the world. <laughs> Did you want to make a comment, Excuse me. I think uh, one thing I learned several years ago is the importance of letting people know where you are when you're on the road. Um, when my daughter was 15 years old, she was in an accident, and uh, we were three hours from home, and people didn't know where we were. They knew we were at a square dance. They knew about the area, but they didn't know how to get a hold of us. She was critically hurt. Um, the girls she were with were able to get her to the hospital. They deemed her life-threatening. Uh, she was lifeline to another hospital. Uh, when we got home, I thought, our children are having a party. They're lifeline all over our house. Uh, we didn't know that they were there to tell us that uh, she was in critical condition. And was a fast-paced trip uh, to a hospital. Um, it was nice to know that if your child is life-threatening, they didn't need parental consent to go ahead and do surgery. Uh, she had a blood clot on the brain. And in two weeks, she was home and fine, and we were very, very lucky. Um, I don't know if we could have changed the situation or if it would have made any difference if they would have been able to get a hold of us. Um, but I think it's important, and, we, and we've learned that now. You know, we let people know exactly. We give them a telephone number or the address, the name of the hall, uh, the place that we're at. You probably maybe... Most of you, some of you maybe had a death in the family, like Kathy said. Um, it's important to let people know how to get a hold of you when you're on the road. Anyone else out there? Yes, April again. By the way, April's on the panel tomorrow, so come back and hear her. <laughs> Hi. I, if you don't already have a cell phone and you live in any metropolitan area, even the outlying areas now can be reached by cell phone. If you're up in the mountains, maybe you can't, but by the time you get to the dance, you're going to have access generally to a cellular site. For the price of a cell phone these days, and for the importance of being able to use the phone if you're at a dance, many of the dances we do are in schools, and there are not telephones available. You are responsible for those people out there, have some way to call 911. If, you, if your children need to reach you, they can reach you that way. It's really not a big expense when you think of what it provides for you. And it is a business expense if that's what you use it for. It is a deduction. I mean, when you look at it in all the different aspects, it really provides a lot for you. And um, so if you don't have one, you might think about one. It, I know we were at a dance one time, and it, it was 10 years after Gary started calling, and we had a dancer go down, and we had to use ours. And it was a big relief to know we had one. However, if you call 911 on a cellular phone, be sure and state your location, because they can't trace that. That's right. Someone, okay, someone else had a hand up there. So we're phones, uh, because the new technology that's out there isn't necessarily the best technology for our profession, especially with the amount of times we have to be on the road and we're on the fringes of those metropolitan areas. Now, we have a cellular phone, but we do not have one of those flip phones or one of those little, you know, Nokia things. We have an old-fashioned, they call it a bag phone. That is more than, than double. It's more like, let me see, those, the, the, 
flip phones are six tenths of a watt. The others are three watts. So that's five times the power. And you get that much better reception and that much more distance from the broadcast towers in our profession. So keep that in mind. Yeah, it's a little, you know, it's a little bulkier to carry around. And you can get battery packs for them and take them in the hall if that's the case. Ours never leaves the car. But... Uh, well, normally it doesn't. But keep that in mind if you don't have a cellular phone and you're thinking of buying one. In our profession, I would strongly recommend the bag phone as opposed to the flip phone. How involved do you get in the dancers' lives? Uh, that's a very good question, but we have two minutes to go. <laughs> We're, in a situa We're in a situation now in which the wife... Uh, took dancing lessons. The husband would not. They're divorced. She remarried. He is now taking dancing lessons in the same club. And the cup, uh, the wife, the ex-wife and her husband have quit the club just recently. They were quite involved. And uh, the ex-husband now is so interested in square dancing that he wants to be a caller. <laughs> And we just re uh, re uh, received the letter that they're quitting the club, and my husband wrote them and asked, is there something we did, the club did, trying to get them back, if not within our own club, but to stay dancing, because they're, she was particularly enthusiastic about it. <laughs> and we did their wedding. I mean, we did the square dance part of their wedding. <laughs> Anyone want to touch that one? <laughs> Uh, we've, we've dealt with that a lot, Betsy and I, because we, uh, one of our clubs we've been doing for 20-some years started out as a college-age club. So we had all of that intermingling type thing, and then there were marriages, divorces, we're teaching some of their kids, and, and it's uh, almost like swaps type of thing. Mostly, we stay out of it. That's not our business. The only thing we do is if a particular incident occurs where it's going to be detrimental, to, first of all, if it's our club, it's a caller run club. If it's an officer-run club, you have to kind of stay out of it. You can make suggestions to the officers of the club as to what they might do. Or if they ask you to do something, you might be able to do it. But if it's not your club, you have to be very careful you don't step on other people's toes or people are just going to say, well, stay out of it. You're just the hired help. And you don't want to arrive at that situation. But we only step in and say, you know, we don't want to get involved, but, you know, if you're going to do this, could you take it? You know, you see people fighting, just take it outside type of thing. Or you can't prevent someone from coming to the club. But I think you're doing the right thing, telling these people, okay, if you feel uncomfortable coming here, but don't quit the activity. And you can't do anything about people feeling uncomfortable. That's going to happen. That happens in every walk of life. But if it's an officer-run club, make your suggestions to them. That's what we have found. And we learned that the hard way. So. I think we'd probably better close it off there, right on the dot. I thank you all for coming. I want to give thanks to the panel, so if you'd like to give them a hand again. And to being a volunteer. We have a committee tomorrow at 9, uh, another panel at quarter of 11, lunch together, if you'd like, at tables that will be marked reserved at lunch tomorrow. The tour is full. So um, that's the word on that. Thank you all for coming.